The quest for the real meaning of quantum mechanics kind of began back in 1927. And uh, so nearly a hundred years later, you might wonder why we still haven't found this meaning or why there's still a lot of dispute over what the meaning of quantum mechanics really is. Um, and I hope that by the time I get to the end, uh, you'll begin to understand why. We're going to begin at the very beginning. I'm going to take you back to the beginning of the turn of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, um, and the science of mechanics. Um, a lot of what tends to, 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 to go past, uh, 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 particularly a, a general audience, um, is that quantum mechanics is a theory of mechanics. Uh, it replaced uh, the classical theory of mechanics that was devised uh, way back in the 17th century by Isaac Newton and other theories that have been used to describe other kinds of motion. Um, mechanics is effectively the science of motion. It, it de deals with equations of motion. And uh, in a case of objects, um, these are described by Newton's three laws of motion, which you remain, remember from your school science classes all those years ago. Uh, Newton's first law, second law, and third law. Um, and, and these, in effect, uh, describe um, ordinary objects, anything from grains of sand to the orbits of, uh, of, of planets around the sun. Um, Alongside these equations of motion, um, we have the motions of waves, um, which are, you know, fairly uh, relatively easy, at least to conceive. Anyone who spent an idle hour on the beach uh, watching uh, rolling surf coming in uh, will get some sense as to how uh, wave fronts uh, hit the beach and slowly fade as they climb uh, up the sand. Um, these motions are described by something called a wave equation and the function that is moving in uh, in a wave equation is what's known as the wave function given this uh, greek symbol uh, psi and, and that uh, was thought at the turn of the 19th century to apply to all kinds of waves including light which was understood to be uh, describable in terms of wave motion uh, as a result of all sorts of different uh, evidence that had been accumulated over the previous hundred years uh, to suggest that that's how uh, it should be described. So we had objects of uh, uh, motions of objects described by Newton's three laws of motion and the motions of waves described by a wave equation. Now, um, one of the things that's most notable about um, uh, waves is that they can undergo various diffraction and interference phenomena. So try to imagine that this is uh, a series of wave fronts. So these are, are waves coming in from the sea um, onto maybe colliding with a harbour wall. Now this harbour wall has two gaps in it. And as the waves squeeze through the gaps, they spread out, the waves spread out beyond and act as though they're new sources of waves. Now, because these waves are going through at the same time, uh, what, we have, what we have is an opportunity for these waves as they spread out beyond the holes to uh, overlap and run into each other. Um, and when that happens, we get a phenomenon known as interference. Um, and that was okay until 1905, when uh, we were obliged to accept that there was revealed one of nature's uh, dirty little secrets. And in fact, it's credit to Albert Einstein, who in 1905 was, was first to suggest that monochromatic radiation, that is light, of, of a single wavelength or a single color, behaves as though the radiation were a discontinuous medium consisting of energy quanta. Now, let me just explain that. Uh, what he's saying, basically, is that what we take to be light waves can also be described as particles. And that really shouldn't come to any surprise to us today because we call these particles photons. So light consists of photons. And yet light also undergoes this kind of diffraction and two-slit interference phenomena that is describable in terms of waves. Now that's already interesting enough, uh, but then in 1923, a French physicist called Louis de Broglie um, 
suddenly had the idea that the discovery made by Einstein in 1905 could be generalized by extending it to all material particles and notably to electrons. What he was basically suggesting that to explain some aspects of what was being revealed in physics laboratories in different parts of the world uh, could be best understood by treating electrons as though they're describable in terms of wave motion. So now you've got this peculiar situation where Although you've got Newton's laws of motion for classical objects, you've got wave equation for classical waves. When you start to look at the motions of tiny objects at the level of atoms and subatomic particles, we get to a situation where things get a bit muddled up. Uh, light waves can be particles, photons, and electrons can be waves. So what's the implication of that? Um, so can we do a two-slit inter interference experiment with electrons? Uh, and what happens if we take a, an electron gun, those of you old enough to remember televisions from the dawn of the television era will know that uh, at the back of each television there was a, an electron gun that would spray electrons on a screen and those electrons would be modulated to produce an image. Same kind of logic, except that instead of a screen we have a, a, a sheet with two holes filled in it. Uh, what would we expect to see? Do we expect to see electrons shooting through either one hole or the other hole and hitting the screen on the other side? Do we expect a particle pattern? Or, although we would struggle to understand how it worked, would we expect to see an interference pattern instead? So the difference between the blue curves and the brown curves in this particular picture. Well, we can do the experiment. Um, uh, these things uh, have been done in exquisite detail uh, since the late uh, 1980s. And, and what we get in many ways is quite reassuring. Um, as we start to see these electrons pass through this two slit apparatus one at a time, we start to see individual dots. And the dot means an electron struck here. Okay, well, that seems to suggest that everything is fine. The electrons are objects, material objects, passing through one slit or the other and hitting the screen uh, to reveal the point uh, where they've struck. Now, the point where they strike appears to be quite random. We get a point here, a point there, a point over here, 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 and so it goes on. But what we find is that when we've accumulated a lot of points, we see something really rather interesting. And so what we have in effect is an interference pattern. But now this is really rather peculiar because it's an inter interference pattern formed from the individual dots, from individual electrons striking the screen at particular places. In other words, there are gaps where the electrons just don't seem to be able to hit or they hit with a low probability. Now, the real challenge is to understand how that's meant to work. So what we see from an experiment like this is electrons do indeed behave like waves, and yet they register as individual points on the screen as though they're behaving also like particles. Um, and this is the big challenge. This, this is the major mystery at the heart of, of quantum mechanics. If we imagine uh, what we could anticipate before we make a measurement and record a little dot, then we would imagine a wave function that looks something like this um, structure on the left. Um, these peaks in this wave function give us a measure of how likely the electron, each individual electron, is likely to hit the screen. Where this is, uh, this peak is, is, is large, it means the electron is likely to hit it uh, more often than, than, than not. Where the uh, value of this wave function is near zero, 
it means that these, these are no-go areas for each individual electron. This is areas that they're going to literally avoid um, as they come through this apparatus one at a time and strike the screen. So um, in order to get from before to after the measurement, something kind of magical needs to happen. Um, here's the final screen. That needs to somehow collapse down so that the electron is recorded as a single dot. So after the measurement, the electron is here. Before the measurement, the electron is kind of almost anywhere where the amplitude of the wave function is not zero. So where the wave function has a value, the electron has a certain probability of being found there. And yet after the measurement, we find it here, one electron, you can't break it up, you can't cut it in half, you can't divide it into bits. It's a elementary particle uh, and we find it's here. Now the question is, how does that happen? Um, this is known as the collapse of the wave function, generally speaking, and it's a huge mystery right at the heart of quantum mechanics. And it's the source of all the pain and the confusion. Um, Einstein didn't like it at all in 1927. He challenged uh, the scientific community who was developing quantum mechanics at the time. Uh, this assumes an entirely peculiar mechanism of action at a distance, which prevents the wave continually distributed in space from producing an action in two places on the screen. Now, what he's saying is the electron isn't in two places on the screen or many places on the screen, but it has a, a chance of being found anywhere on the screen where the wave function is not zero, and yet it's found when we record the dot in one location. And, and Einstein just wanted to know how this happens. Um, by action at a distance, what Einstein is actually saying is he's taking this wave function literally as a, as a real thing, as a real phenomenon. The electron is described as a wave. It has a wave function. And therefore, he wants to know how we get from the left-hand side of this picture to the right-hand side of this picture. And something doesn't sit right. Uh, it certainly doesn't sit right with Einstein. Um, in actual practice, uh, what we really know is we know the left-hand side, we know the before picture, and we know the after picture. Uh, what we've got in between these two is um, a mystery. Uh, the American physicist John Wheeler called it the great smoky dragon. We know the dragon's tail. Uh, that's the before side of this uh, picture. And we know the dragon's head. Uh, that's the right side of this picture. But in the middle, uh, everything is shrouded in mystery and uh, indeed some great confusion. Um, it gets slightly worse because if the collapse of the wave function happens at a, a level of elementary particles, that's one thing. But there's nothing at all in the equations of, of quantum mechanics to say that it should stop there. So Erwin Schrödinger, who was one of the founders of quantum mechanics in 1935, thought he'd have a bit of a dig at uh, what quantum mechanics seemed to be saying by developing this outrageous uh, thought experiment in which we place um, a um, small quantity of radioactive substance and a Geiger counter, such that within an hour or so, uh, there's uh, a 50-50 chance that there will be a radioactive disintegration that will produce a detection in the Geiger counter, a click. If the Geiger counter clicks, it releases a hammer which smashes a flask of prussic acid. The prussic acid is released and kills, sadly, a cat uh, that Schrodinger is imprisoned inside this box. And that's all very well. So we set this experiment up, we close the lid, uh, and we seal it. And we ask ourselves, OK, so how now should we describe the physical state of the cat? Uh, well, if we take the expressions and the equations of quantum mechanics seriously um, and don't draw a line between uh, a quantum world ending and a kind of classical world beginning, then there is a sense in which, as Schrodinger suggested, that according to the wave function for the total system after an hour, Sit venia verbo, pardon the phrase, the living and dead cat are smeared out in equal measure. And that's exactly equivalent to the electron appearing 
in a single dot at the moment in which it's recorded or measured. At that moment, the wave function collapses. Uh, what Schrodinger is basically saying is at what point does the Geiger counter trigger, at what point does the cat die, if it's going to die or remains alive? Um, does it happen while the cat is in the box and opening the lid just simply tells us whether it's alive or dead? Or does the act of opening the box itself cause the cat to move, collapse from a state of suspended animation of some peculiar kind into a state of aliveness or deadness? And this is just one of the many conundrums that quantum mechanics throws up. And uh, this was such a source of, of considerable consternation to the founders of this theoretical structure, Niels Bohr here on the left and Albert Einstein on the right, uh, that these two guys engaged in an extraordinary debate, one of the most uh, exciting um, and challenging debates in the entire history of science. It began in 1927, as you saw from Einstein's challenge, a peculiar mechanism and action, action at a distance, all the way through to a very famous challenge that comes in 1935 that I will tell you a little bit more about uh, in a second. Um, often this um, uh, debate is characterized by one of Einstein's famous phrases, which is, God does not play dice. Uh, what Einstein was really meaning here is that Given that we seem to be in a situation where a wave function collapses, but randomly, we don't know where the dot's going to appear, or we don't know whether the cat's going to be alive or dead when we open the box. He, he, he didn't like this sense of randomness and, and uh, a lack of connection between cause and effect. Anything can happen. Um, and he didn't like the idea that uh, um, his philosophical God uh, would somehow play dice with the universe. Uh, Bohr's answer was, well, it's really not for us to tell God how he should run the world. But what this is really about um, is, 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 the, is the nature of reality or answering the question of what is real. And I hope to be able to persuade you um, that this really now, any questions we want to ask about what's going on here with quantum mechanics, what we need now is a is a, a heavy diet of, of of philosophy if we're going to understand the nature of the debate between Bohr and Einstein and the nature of the interpretations that have been developed over the course of the last hundred years or so to try to explain what quantum theory actually means. Now I don't know if you remember this scene. This is from the 1990 movie The Matrix, of course. Uh, two characters, Morpheus and Neo. Uh, Morpheus for the first time being exposed to a computer simulation um, and, and he, he just, it's so real to him that he, he can't quite get his head around the fact that he's actually in a computer simulation. And Morpheus tells him that, well, question what reality is because real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. That's all very fine. That's a bit of sixth form uh, philosophy. Uh, very true. Um, we go around uh, uh, living our daily lives, relying on the way that our mind interprets signals that, that we receive, what we see, hear, touch, taste and smell. And they get synthesized in our conscious minds as a representation of our reality. Um, uh, but the simple fact of the matter is you rely so heavily on your sensory inputs um, can you trust them? Are they delivering to you a reliable representation of that reality? Or are you being fooled? Are you in a matrix? Uh, are you being messed with uh, some evil genius who's manipulating your sensory inputs and giving the illusion of reality? Um, to be honest with you, um, physicists don't spend too much time thinking about this kind of thing. They prefer to be a bit more pragmatic. Um, and if we're to make any progress, we need to get beyond this kind of picture and, uh, and, and make, some, make some propositions and philosophers like propositions. So in order to answer this question, what is real and what does this have to do with quantum mechanics? Um, I'm going to give you uh, two uh, realist propositions to start. And it's really the third one that we need to spend the time talking about this evening. And I love this. this uh, um, 
quote from Einstein, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. That'll come back in just a second. And I want to shoot straight to the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant um, in 1781. He distinguished between what he called noumena and phenomena. Now, if we rely on what we sense, uh, our sensory inputs, um, then we have to accept that what we see in the world around us are things as they appear. Uh, I'm sitting here at my desk looking at my computer, and this is my desk as it appears. This is my computer as it appears. You're doing the same. Hopefully, you've got a glass of wine by now uh, and uh, uh, kicking back uh, with your feet up, uh, enjoying this talk. Um, and you become conscious of the fact that, that appearances uh, are what's driving your conscious experience. And noumena then are the things underneath that, the things beneath the appearance, um, the, the desk in itself, uh, the computer in itself. Now, we, we don't want to spend too much time debating what the difference between these might be. Um, there's absolutely no way we can know things in themselves. We can only ever acquire knowledge of things as they appear. Kind of by definition, uh, because unless we perceive them, we can see them we, we can't anticipate or experience them um, but Kant insisted very importantly that there can be no appearances without anything that appears and this is fundamentally important um, my favorite uh, quote actually on the question of reality comes from the great um, scientific uh, science fiction writer Philip K Dick who uh, once wrote that reality is that which when you stop believing in it doesn't go away and, and there are some aspects of current politics in the United States and for that matter in the United Kingdom where we are facing a reality which even though we might believe reality would be different, reality isn't going to go away and somewhere along the line we're going to have to confront it, uh, whether it's coronavirus or what. Um, and that leads me to my first realist proposition, proposition one which I've, I've said the moon is still there when nobody looks at it or thinks about it. And, and what this is, it's an assumption. It's an assumption of what is known as objective reality. I am not going to waste any more time wondering about what's real objectively. I'm not going to worry about if I were to walk out to go to the bathroom at this stage, you all cease to exist because um, I'm no longer there to perceive you. Uh, that's just um, a waste of my thought processes. I'm just going to assume that you're still there. I'm going to assume that you're listening to this, and I'm going to assume that you're enjoying uh, this, uh, at least so far. But bear in mind, it's an assumption. Um, I can believe the moon still exists in the sky at night when nobody's looking at it or thinking about it, uh, but it's nevertheless an assumption. Okay, but then what do we do about things that we can't perceive directly, like electrons? Well, that's a bit tricky, and philosophers have debated about the reality of invisible entities, like uh, electrons and photons and quarks and other things for a good many years. Again, I don't want to beat too much about the bush here. I'm going to go straight for another proposition, and I'm going to follow Canadian philosopher Ian Hacking, I mean, a book in 1983 came up with this splendid sentence, if you can spray them, then they are real. In other words, um, even though we might not be able to perceive them directly, if we can manipulate them, do things with them, spray them, push them down a, a wire, if I can push electrons down a wire or through a circuit or through a computer, uh, 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 a set of computer hardware, uh, then, then I've got good reason to believe that they really do exist. So electrons really do exist pretty much with the properties that we'd want to ascribe to them as physicists. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a proposition. We, we can't see electrons, not so far anyway, in terms of our current uh, development of, uh, of technology, uh, but we assume them to exist with the properties that we want to give them. Right, but now we come to the tricky question. So we've established the existence of objective reality, or we've assumed uh, the moon is still there when nobody looks. We've established the reality of invisible entities like electrons. We assume they exist with the properties that we want to give them, uh, even though we can't see them. Uh, but what do we do now about this thing called the quantum wave function? And this 
and the reason I'm going through this is this is really the heart of the, the real heart of the Bohr Einstein debate. Um, and I want to explain what I mean by what do I say? How can the quantum wave function not be real uh, in inverted commas? And I'm going to contrast that with the opposite assumption that, that the wave function, as it's described in, in the equations of quantum mechanics, has a real physical significance. It describes the real physical state of real physical things like electrons. All right, so take, let's take a look at what we mean when we say the wave function is not real. What, what does that mean? Uh, well, it, it means that, that we look at the wave function simply as a kind of bookkeeping device, like a hieroglyph. It represents something, we, we don't know what, uh, but uh, we've learned through the equations of quantum mechanics to code our experience. Don't, don't be too distracted here by coded information. I don't mean anything elaborate or spooky. I mean, we take experience, we do things in the laboratory, we gain an experience, matter behaves this way, and we code for that in the equations of quantum mechanics, represented by this thing called the quantum wave function. And using this device allows us to connect past with future. We all draw on all of that past experience, and this allows us to make some predictions. Okay, so if we do this, if we do this kind of experiment or make this kind of observation, then this is what we should see with a certain probability. Um, this means that the wave function actually doesn't collapse because there's nothing to collapse. Um, the wave function is not a physical thing. Um, it's effectively representing the change of the state of knowledge of the electron, or for that matter, Schrodinger's cat. Um, all that happens if we lift the lid of the box on Schrodinger's cat is the state of our knowledge changes. Before we lift the lid, we'd say, well, we don't know. The cat could be alive or it could be dead. It's in a kind of superposition state of, of both. But when we lift the lid, ah, the sad, it's sad, but the cat is, is dead, unfortunately. Or, yay, the cat's alive. Assuming that the wave function is not real in the sense of uh, having a real physical significance means that quantum mechanics as a theoretical structure is complete. There's, there's nothing more to discover about it. All the equations that we've got are all the equations there are as far as quantum mechanics is concerned. And quantum mechanics has been developing since the early 1920s, mid 1920s, uh, and it's now a very, very sophisticated um, set of, of formulae that allows us to do some exquisite stuff um, uh, in the quantum domain. Uh, and we know it works. So uh, what this is saying is that there's nothing more to discover about it. And this was Bohr's position. It, it's effectively an anti-realist position, but I want to be absolutely clear. Don't take this to suggest for a minute that Niels Bohr denied reality or he was against objective reality or even against the reality of electrons. He's known as the father of the atom in many ways or the raw, the, Bother, the Bohr Rutherford model of the atom. And it would be very unusual for someone with Bohr, who he won a Nobel Prize for this. It would be very unusual if a Nobel laureate would then deny the reality of the things he's known for discovering. Um, it means that Bohr was anti-realist with regard to the significance of the quantum wave function. And in fact, he's quoted as saying, there is no quantum world. There is only an abstract quantum physical description. It is wrong to think that the task of physics is to find out how nature is. Physics concerns what we can say about nature. Now, although that's not a direct quote, I can assure you that there are other quotes directly from Bohr that, that certainly have this flavor. This is what he meant. And this is what I mean by calling him anti-realist. Now, the opposite side of this um, uh, set of, uh, uh, of, of descriptions is uh, the assumption that, that the wave function is telling us something significant. It's telling us something more fundamental about the underlying quantum physics. Um, in, in, in this case, just as Einstein suggested when he was talking about a peculiar action at a distance, uh, the wave function has to do something really strange. How do we get from the left-hand side before the measurement to the right-hand side after the measurement? Something has to happen physically in order for one to connect with the other. 
And it means that if you assume that, then quantum mechanics simply cannot be complete. There's an underlying structure underneath quantum mechanics that if we have the wit to find it, then we can actually even go beyond quantum mechanics and, and delve into sort of something deeper uh, concerning the nature of reality. And this, of course, was Einstein's view. Einstein was effectively a realist. Again, not just in terms of objective reality or the reality of electrons, but in terms of the reality of the wave function in some description. And there are various degrees of realism that I won't bore you with the details with. But effectively, Einstein was a realist about this. Um, and when pushed to argue why he should take that position, uh, this is one of my favorite Einstein quotes. I have no better expression than the term religious for this trust in the rational character of reality and in its being accessible to some extent to human reason. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's, almost, it's almost a faith. Um, quantum mechanics can't be the complete story. There must be more to reality. There are aspects that are missing in the structure of quantum mechanics, a direct link between cause and effect, determinism, uh, and Einstein was was concerned that, in fact, uh, some things had gone astray. Uh, there was absolutely no doubt quantum mechanics worked wonderfully well, but something had gone missing. And it's, it's a faith on Einstein's part that that something needed to be found. So in 1935, he came up with this devilish um, uh, thought experiment called the Einstein Podolsky Rosen or EPR experiment. And it really is a direct challenge to quantum mechanics in its current form. Um, uh, they wanted to know, is quantum mechanics complete? And, and the nature of the challenge is involves um, the creation of a pair of entangled particles. So this is not just one electron, but maybe two, or maybe two photons that have interacted in the past or have been created um, as a result of some atomic process, um, but together so that their properties are subtly connected uh, quantum mechanically. And to give you some sense of how that works, let me just show you this third video. So some kind of interaction occurs and two particles move apart. Now, the, the particles on this case, the one on the left, the one on the right, are described by a single wave function. Now, I've depicted them here as little balls with, with arrows depicting the spin of these particles. Don't worry too much about what that means. It's a property, a quantum property of particles like electrons. And don't be confused by the fact that there are two spins each side. There's only one particle, one on the left, one on the right. Uh, but what this wave function represents is a situation that we've created whereby uh, we have a, a superposition of two particles in opposite states, in opposite spin states. So if the one on the left is spinning up, pointing upwards, the one on the right must be pointing downwards. But if the one on the left is pointing downwards, then the one on the right must be pointing upwards. In other words, there's a law of physics, uh, a conservation law, that means these spins must be preserved. So each particle has a 50-50 probability for being spin up or spin down, but whatever they are, they must be opposed. So the way that I think of this, if you can see in the small screen, is, is they, they move apart. If it's down, this one is up. If it's up, this one is down. And that's the nature of the correlation or the nature of the entanglement of the two quantum particles. Could be electrons, could be photons. So we make a measurement on one of them and we find the spin is up. OK, great. That must mean the wave function collapses if you're taking a realist interpretation of the wave function and what it represents. And that means you've immediately discovered the properties of the particle on the right without touching it, without looking at it, without disturbing it in any way. And this was extraordinary. This was an extraordinary challenge because what it seems to suggest is that as a result of entanglement, these particles can be an arbitrarily long distance apart. 
by the time we do this experiment, by the time we make a measurement on the left-hand side. And it begs all sorts of questions. It's exactly like, again, the collapse of the wave function where we recorded a single dot on the screen, uh, whereas before the measurement, we, we, you know, the electron could be distributed anywhere on the screen where the wave function has a positive amplitude. Here we're saying is the electron spin could be either up or down, but if it's one or the other, then the other partner, its entangled partner, must be the opposite orientation. And this is so mysterious. There's no explanation anywhere for how this might work in the equations of quantum mechanics. And so EPR not unreasonably uh, said that no reasonable definition of reality could be expected to permit this. Therefore, quantum mechanics must be incomplete. There must be a level underneath this that quantum mechanics uh, doesn't contain, but nonetheless is there in nature, uh, if only we have the wit to discover what it is. So the, the question is, OK, that, that's fine. If we just go back um, to the situation where we have this superposition, um, as you can see, the particle on the left can be up or down. The particle on the right can be down or up. Um, why don't we just assume that these particles are either up or down all along? So the particle moves to the left already up. The particle moves to the right already down. The particle to the left is already down. So the particle to the right is already up. Why not just assume that? Uh, why go through this elaborate business of a superposition and, and a collapse of the wave function? It doesn't seem to make too much sense. Well, the interesting thing is that if you do that, then you make predictions that disagree with quantum mechanics. Um, and this was a discovery made by Irish physicist John Bell uh, back in 1964. And, and you'll see the reason for the multicolored socks in a second. Um, John Bell was fascinated by the EPR experiment. Um, and he was constantly on the lookout for everyday examples of correlations, physical correlations in, in ordinary life. And he thought he'd found a perfect example in the dress sense of one of his colleagues at CERN. Uh, called Reinhard Bertelmann. Um, and he explained that you know, Dr. Bertelmann likes to wear two socks of different colors. Um, he'd just grown tired of sorting his socks out and said, why bother? Why not just wear randomly colored socks, uh, one on each foot? Um, which color he will have on a given foot on a given day is quite unpredictable. But when you see that the first sock is pink, you can be already sure that the second sock will not be pink. In other words, if the electron over here is up, you can be sure the electron over there is down. Uh, observation of the first and experience of Bertelmann gives immediate information about the second. There is no accounting for tastes, but apart from that, there is no mystery here. And is not this EPR business just the same? So this is exactly what Bell is saying. Why not assume that when these particles set off, they set off already in the states that we measure them in, whether that way or that way? And to be absolutely clear, Reinhold Bertelmann does exist. Um, here he is wearing multicolored socks. Apparently that's a habit he still maintains today. Okay, and this leads us to something called Bell's inequality, which I'm going to attempt to explain, but rather superficially. So forgive me for this. If you want to have a little bit more detail, by all means, ask me a question about it later. When we make a measurement of electron spins, and we go through this process down, up, or up, down, like this, uh, then we do that using a system of magnets. So we have a magnet with north-south poles. We pass the electron between the poles of the magnet. And it, if it's deflected upwards, it's spin up. If it's deflected downwards, it's spin down. And if we orient, orientate two magnets so that their north-south poles are aligned in the laboratory, uh, then we'd expect to see exactly what we've talked about so far, a 50-50 chance of spin up, spin down. So spin up this side, down this side, down this side, up this side. But what Bell realized uh, is, in fact, we can actually be a lot more devious than that by actually changing the orientations of the magnets. We open up um, a whole new set of possibilities. 
And what he discovered effectively was a situation whereby that if we do assume that there's some mechanism, it's called a, a local hidden variable mechanism that determines which spin states we're going to find in the electrons as they move apart. If there's some mechanism like that, then uh, changing the orientations of the magnets we use will actually produce predictions which won't agree with the predictions of quantum mechanics. And these are the orientations he suggested. The angles really don't matter, but I just want you to get some sense. This is changing the orientations of the magnets that the two electrons are going to pass through, uh, one to the left, one to the right. Um, changing their relative orientations then leads to something called Bell's inequality. And here it is. It's the only piece of maths in this entire talk. Um, Bell's inequality says up and down result in experiment one plus the probability of detecting an up and down result in experiment two must be greater than or equal to the probability of detecting an up and down result in experiment three if we assume that these spins are somehow fixed from the moment the electrons are created or they've interacted. Um, so that begs a question, what, do, what does such a mechanism predict? Well, interestingly, in experiment one, uh, the prediction is for this probability to be 12 and a half percent. What that means is that if we detect 200 pairs of electrons, we'd find that 25 pairs um, uh, had an up and down, hang on, get this right, up and down result. But look what quantum mechanics predicts. It actually predicts a lower probability. For experiment two, the probability is the same, both 25%. And for experiment three, um, the probability in local hidden variables is 37.5%, but in quantum mechanics, it's 42.7%. I think you know what's coming. If we add the probability for the first experiment to the probability for the second experiment, then Bell's inequality says the result should be greater than or at least equal to the probability for experiment three. In other words, the local hidden variables, 37.5% is greater than or indeed equal to 37.5%. Okay, good, everything is good in the world. But now look at quantum mechanics. It suggests that 32.3% is greater than or equal to 42.7%. And of course, that's not true. Nothing's gone wrong here with the way that we've been calculating the probabilities. It's just that quantum mechanics is saying you can't have this. You can't assume that these electrons set off already in fixed spin states, either this way or that way. In other words, quantum mechanics predicts results which violate Bell's inequality. So what do the experiments say? Now, um, Bell devised this uh, inequality in 1964. Um, it took about 10 years. Um, John Clauser and Stuart Friedman were among the first to, to do a, a proper experiment to test this inequality in the laboratory. Um, they produced results which indeed violate Bell's inequality, but there were still plenty of, of loopholes. Um, the definitive test First definitive tests were actually published in 1982 by French physicist Alain Aspect and his colleagues at the University of Paris. And I want to tell you about two other experiments that have been done, one in 1999 and one in 2010. So Alain Aspect and his colleagues worked at the University of Paris. Um, they measured the orientations. In fact, these weren't electrons. It was uh, light. Uh, effectively photon spin or photon polarization, horizontal, vertical. But in effect, uh, get this right. Um, so when they've moved a distance apart, um, a measurement is made on this one and this one, and we look at the correlation between the two. And <clears throat> these measurements involved a distance of 13 meters between detection. Now, 13 meters is a distance that takes about 40 billionths of a second for a signal to cross at the speed of light. Uh, but these particles were detected within a 20 billionth of a second time window, half the time required for a signal to be transmitted from one particle to another at the speed of light. 
And what that means basically is that there's no way having measured the orientation this side that somehow this particle then could discover what this result was and therefore orientate itself to preserve the laws of physics. They found that Bell's inequality is violated. Uh, Nicholas Gissin, um, they studied uh, correlations between uh, detections between two small villages in uh, Switzerland, uh, Bellevue and Benex, about 11 kilometers apart, uh, just outside Geneva. Bell's inequality was violated. Anton Zeilinger, I think, took a holiday uh, in 2010 uh, to La Palma and Tenerife. Um, and so these, again, correlations between distant particles now 144 kilometers apart. Bell's inequality was violated. And there's absolutely no doubt uh, from all of this and subsequent experiments, some of which have involved uh, bouncing um, photons off uh, distant satellites in, uh, in orbit, uh, where the distances are even bigger than 144 kilometers. There's absolutely no doubt that we, we can't make this assumption. We, we can't assume that these particles begin their journey, their separation, they separate already in fixed physical states. Uh, reality, therefore, according to this assumption, must be non-local. If we want to take a realistic interpretation of the wave function, then it's by definition not local. Somehow or another, um, these particles are in communication, and I'm putting that in inverted commas or square, uh, scare quotes, uh, to just try and convey that I, I actually am arm waving here and I don't know what that means. So what does this mean in terms of the two ways of looking at the quantum wave function? Uh, again, uh, for those advocates who argue that the wave function isn't real, um, this doesn't describe the real physical states of things such as electrons or cats. So in fact, there's, there's, there's no real big deal here. It simply codes our pre-existing knowledge and allows us to make predictions for future experiments. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, because there's nothing to see here. But just don't ask how nature does this conjuring tree. How does this correlation persist over 144 kilometers between La Palma and Tenerife? Don't expect to find any answers from an anti-realist interpretation of the wave function. But if the wave function is assumed to be physically real, uh, then we've got a real problem. Um, this will make your head hurt significantly. Um, do we have to invoke a collapse of the wave function, spooky action at a distance, cats that are once both alive and dead? Uh, we've definitely got a lot of explaining to do. Uh, what's interesting is that it's in the nature of the beast that you either accept one kind of interpretation, one structure of interpretation uh, over another, and either say that there's no problem, we'll just continue, we shut up and calculate, we carry on as normal, whatever, I mean, don't worry about it. Or we do worry about it and we want to dig deeper and we want to try and find out how nature really works, how nature does this conjuring trick. And this leads me to a, a metaphor for scientific theorizing. I'm going to start to move fairly quickly now through these closing slides. Uh, you'll find more details about this metaphor in, in the new book. Um, so Im imagine... We, we talk glibly about reality uh, without often being very explicit about what we mean. And I hope you've got some sense that we can't make too much headway without making some assumptions, without these realist propositions. Um, there's what I call metaphysical reality, and it's how we think about reality, what, what we think, what characteristics we think reality should possess, some sense of continuity, consistency, uh, laws of conservation, um, things that existing that we can't see, all of those kinds of things. Um, and empirical reality is where we do all our observations and our measurements. It's the world of, of, of experience. It's our experience of reality. Uh, now, metaphysical reality is where we find all our ideas. Uh, these are ideas that, you know, maybe space-time curves, or maybe uh, there's action at a distance, or maybe there's a collapse of the wave function, whatever set of ideas we need to hold a set of concepts together that, that you know, helps us to understand what we think reality is all about. Of course, empirical reality is we find all the facts, you know, when we make a measurement and it's this or this or that or that and so on and so on. Now, <laughs> 
my metaphor i've obviously read too many um uh, um uh, novels uh, but but i see the task of science to be sailing the ship across the sea of representation what we need to do is to move back and forth between these two shores um between metaphysical reality and empirical reality we go to metaphysical reality and we pick up ideas how, how do we think reality really works then we sail to empirical reality we make some measurements and some observations we say oh, okay well that doesn't work but that works okay well that kind of helps and i don't know what that means so let's take that back and see if we can get another idea and the ship goes back and forth between the two shores um, slowly but surely converging mixing blending the ideas and the facts together into what we then call a scientific theory um, a workable hopefully workable and successful scientific theory slight problems this is a hazardous trip um, close to empirical reality uh, we find the homeric um, uh, from homer's odyssey we find Scylla, uh, a, a rock shoal um, an ugly brute of a, of a thing where there are great dangers that will become so obsessed with sticking to the facts that we'll have no explanation there'll be no ideas um, and opposite that we find charybdis a, a whirlpool of, of metaphysical speculation full of ideas but for which there's no facts to back it up and we don't really want to be trapped in either of these we want to try to avoid them so we, we have to try and navigate the ship of science between these ideas and the facts so that what we come up with is a, a virtuous and workable scientific theory and this then gives us the landscape a landscape i call a game of theories we have anti-realist uh, interpretations or theories we have realist interpretations I'm going to go through these uh, quite quickly. Uh, we've got, bear in mind, we've got Scylla and we've got Charybdis. Uh, you may have heard of the Copenhagen interpretation. This was effectively Bohr's position. Uh, physics concerns what we can say about nature, but there are some more recent descendants of Copenhagen. Carlo Rovelli um, has advanced uh, something called relational quantum mechanics, uh, which says that physical states don't exist until they establish a relationship with something. There are information theoretic interpretations favored by Anton Zeilinger and Kazilab Bruckner and others, uh, which says it's all just coded information or experience. Um, there are variations on interpreting quantum probability, reasonable axioms, consistent histories, histories and something called quantum Bayesianism. Um, there's details as to what these interpretations mean uh, in, in the new book. And these are all anti-realist. These are all, these all say that the wave function is a prescription. It's a hieroglyph. Uh, it allows us to code our experience such that we can then make predictions to what to expect in experiments that we do in the future. On the realist side, we've got obviously local hidden variables, but we know from all the work on Bell's inequality that that's ruled out. So we can put a cross through that. But there are still other flavors of realist interpretations. There's uh, one that joins together the notion of physical waves and particles, so-called pilot wave theory or de Broglie-Bohm theory. Um, there's a way to make the collapse physically real. Uh, in other words, it doesn't appear in the equations of quantum mechanics, so let's put it in, um, uh, so-called GRW theory, um, where we actually physically engineer uh, the wave function to collapse in the appropriate way. Um, we could say, well, you know, none of this happens until the quantum superposition or whatever it might be encounters a conscious mind. Schrodinger's cat is indeed in a suspended animation state of both alive and dead until we lift the lid of the box and, and look and we register with our conscious mind and our consciousness is a is a is a, a affecting effectively or creating the collapse of the wave function uh, and then there's my least favorite interpretation which says well the collapse doesn't occur at all uh, what happens is the universe splits so in one universe the dot is here of the electron and in another universe the dot has appeared over there or in one universe the spin is like this and that but in another universe it's like that um you take that for me with a pinch of salt i think it's uh, giving up uh, it's very very heavily burdened with its own metaphysics and for my money many worlds is slipping 
into the whirlpool of wild and constrained metaphysical nonsense about the nature of reality. That's my opinion. And that's it. That's the landscape. It's by no means a complete landscape. This is, these are not all the possible interpretations of quantum, uh, quantum mechanics you can find out there, but it gives you a flavor. Um, you're going to want to know what I think. And I can tell you that for many years, I was very much in favor of Einstein's realist position. I enjoyed his tussle with Bohr. I enjoyed the work of John Bell, um, attempts to dismantle the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, but since the success of, of these experiments to test local hidden variables and looking at what is needed for us to assume if we want to take a realist uh, position, um, I, I've, I've come, I have to admit to myself uh, that I've got, like the great philosopher Han Solo, uh, can we move the, the picture? So, thank you. Like the great philosopher Han Solo, I've got a very bad feeling about all this. So have we reached the end? Well, we've reached the end of this talk. Uh, you'll be relieved to hear, I'm sure. Uh, but have we really reached the end of, of this particular story? I, I just wanted to quote from a book by Stephen Weinberg, uh, published some years ago. Um, he was talking about a very different kind of final theory. This is the final ultimate theory of everything, uh, which would include quantum mechanics and Einstein's general theory of relativity. But I, I like what he said here. A final theory will be final in only one sense, that it will bring an end to a certain sort of science, the ancient search for those principles that cannot be explained by deeper principles. In other words, we reach the bottom. And there's nowhere to go once we've reached the bottom. There are no deeper principles. For me, I interpret that as finality meaning that there are no more scientific questions. In other words, we won't be able to do a test or get evidence for any deeper principles because there are none. Uh, that's what final means. Uh, but we would still be left with philosophical questions, absolutely no doubt. Um, you can formulate good arguments one way or another way. But the lack of any kind of empirical evidence will mean that any kind of consensus on the answers to these philosophical questions will remain forever elusive. And the question I will leave you with to ponder as you finish your wine um, and uh, maybe think about dinner is, is this where we are now with quantum mechanics? Um, I, for one, don't think so, but I, I don't at the moment like the current landscape of realist theories and the assumptions that are have to be made um i don't think the search will will end i don't think there are too many physicists who are so perturbed by quantum mechanics uh, that to me it suggests that they won't give up the search but the search has now become very very difficult very difficult and it's really difficult to see how any kind of progress can be made certainly short term maybe in another 50 or 100 years time we'll have some answers but for the moment we are stuck uh, and most of the questions that we want to ask about quantum mechanics are largely philosophical in nature and understanding the philosophy is um, is necessary in my view to understand the nature of the of the struggle that we have with the interpretation of this theory we're at the end. As always, when a tour like this, we uh, exit through the bookstore, guys. Uh, I just want to bring to your attention four of my books published over the years. The Quantum Story is published back in 2011. It's effectively a story of the history of the development of quantum mechanics from 1900 to the present, but also including particle physics and the so-called standard model of particle physics. Um, quantum space, I gave a talk at the RI on that uh, in, I think, 2018, or it may have been uh, February, no, February last year, February 2019. It's about attempts to bring quantum mechanics together with general relativity to create a, a theory of quantum space, a, a quantum uh, uh, description of space and the universe itself. Um, I wouldn't recommend this book for anyone without some uh, capability in mathematics. The Quantum Cookbook is is a, is a book uh, intended to introduce uh, um, quantum the, the equations of quantum mechanics to uh, probably undergraduate students or 
good A-level students who are competent in, in, in maths. Um, I, I think there's a lot to be gained uh, from that book from students. It's a book I would have loved to have had when I was 18 years old. And then the recent book published a couple of weeks ago in the UK, uh, Quantum Reality, which is a popular book. You won't find any mathematics in this, uh, but it goes through pretty much um, everything that I've spoken about this evening. And I just want to thank you for watching.